I'm Kathy Obradovich, Opinion Editor at the Des Moines Register, and we are here with Andrew Young, a Democratic presidential candidate from New York. Welcome, Mr. Mr. I'm sorry, Mr. Yang. I'm sorry, I mispronounced your name already. Uh, we have members of the Register Editorial Board and other Register Editor and Reporters here. Uh, let's go around the room. Carol Hunter, Executive Editor. Rachel Schattenberger, Politics Editor. Uh, Gabe e. Simmons, uh, Reporter. Richard Bell from the ed Editorial Board. Okay, and Mr. Yang, uh, just wanted to start off, first of all, thank you again for being here. And please, uh, just give us a little bit of background about yourself and why you want to be president. I'd be happy to. First, thank you for this opportunity. I'm a huge fan of both your publication. I've had very positive experiences ever since I arrived here in Iowa about a year ago. I'm also a huge fan of local journalism generally. I think that local journalism is vital to a functioning democracy. It's very difficult to be able to vote on local issues if you don't really know what's happening. And unfortunately now, over 1,200 newspapers have gone out of business around the country. Uh, and studies have shown that if you don't have a local paper, then your voting becomes more polarized and less informed, which is not a shock. Obviously, if you don't have a local paper, then you'll end up voting along party lines more often. So if you believe in democracy, you have to believe in local journalism. And we've exited a happy time when local journalism was able to be supported through classified ads for the most part. And then the classified ads all migrated online. There wasn't a replacement revenue source. Uh, and one of the things I found is that many communities could sustain a vibrant local paper if they didn't have to compete with the profit margins of public companies. In other words, if you had a community that wanted to have a local paper and they were happy for it to be break even or very modestly profitable, many, many communities could support that. The problem is that that's not the way ownership works of many of these papers anymore. You have hedge funds that just buy up uh, the, the papers and then ring them for operating profits. Uh, and that's right now something that we've taken for granted in American life, that if the market likes it, it's good, and if the market doesn't like it, it's bad. Um, but to me, we have to be bigger and better than that if we're going to have a thriving or even functional democracy, and that would include finding non-market ways to support local journalism. So I've proposed a local journalism fund that would provide matching grants to communities to find cooperative models of journalism or public-private partnerships or even philanthropic models. I've proposed a journalism fellows program where every congressional district has a journalist paid for by the government because, again, by the same thinking, how can you have people voting for uh, local leaders if they don't know what's happening in, in their communities? Uh, but we have to support local journalism if we still believe in democracy. I very much believe in democracy, and I believe in the work you all are doing. I actually think it's kind of a jerk move to show up and say, here I am, here are my ideas, please spread them around the community. And meanwhile, many of the journalists I talk to uh, are looking at their own enterprise their own, their own future and looking up and saying, are we going to be here in the same form 10, 12 years from now? Uh, that to me is not very considerate, honestly. It's like uh, you all are providing me an, an awesome opportunity to be able to speak to your, uh, your residents and your community members, and we have to do better by you all. So that's just a segue that the fact that I just really love what you all do and believe in it. Uh, it's for who I am, why I'm running for president. I'm a serial entrepreneur who uh, who started his career as an unhappy lawyer for five months, hated it, left to start an ill-fated dot-com that had its mini rise and maximum fall. My parents still told people I was a lawyer because it you know, was an easier story. Uh, and then after that business went under, I worked at another company, and then I became the head of an education company that grew to become number one in the U.S. and was acquired by a public company in 2009. And this was the wake of the financial crisis, and I saw what was happening in communities around the country. And I had a bunch of friends from, uh, from Brown or Columbia that had participated in Wall Street's wrecking of the economy, frankly. And so I thought, well, we need something better for energized or ambitious young people to do than head to Wall Street and build these financial instruments. So I quit my job. I started an organization called Venture for America that channeled talented college grads to work at early stage growth companies in Detroit, Cleveland, St. Louis, Baltimore, New Orleans, Birmingham, and spent seven years building that organization. 
Uh, and during that time, I had a front row seat to the reason why, in my mind, Donald Trump is our president today. And one thing I'd ask people here in Iowa, how did Donald Trump win Iowa by nine points? How did he win Wisconsin, Missouri, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Michigan? And to me, the reason why he won your state and all of these states is that we automated away four million manufacturing jobs in those states. We automated away about 40,000 manufacturing jobs here in Iowa. And what does that mean to your communities? That's 40,000 families and the ripple effects of removing those jobs uh, spread far, far beyond even just those families. And unfortunately, we're now going to do the exact same thing to millions of retail jobs, call center jobs, fast food jobs, truck driving jobs, accounting jobs, and on and on through the economy. I was just at Iowa 80 in Davenport. They are very proud of the fact that they're the biggest truck stop in the country. 5,000 people stop there every day. My friends in Silicon Valley are working on trucks that can drive themselves that they believe will be on the highways within five to 10 years. Driving a truck is the most common job in 29 states, including this one. So what happens when my friends prove successful? Uh, so I was seeing all of this over the last seven years. Donald Trump wins. We're scapegoating immigrants for something that immigrants have nothing to do with. My country does not understand what's happening to it. And so I said, well, we need to, one, explain to America that we're in the midst of the greatest economic transformation in our country's history, what experts are calling the fourth industrial revolution. And Donald Trump's victory was a manifestation of the first segment of that wave. And then we need to enact real solutions to help us all transition through this time. And so I'm championing a freedom dividend of $1,000 a month for every American adult that would channel uh, channel billions of dollars right here to Iowa. It would create about 40,000 new jobs here in Iowa because if you imagine $1,000 a month in the hands of every Iowan, how much of that would be spent right here in the state? The vast majority of it, uh, we know it would go to car repairs you've been putting off and tutoring uh, services and the occasional night out and health care and uh, education bills and daycare and everything else. Most of that money stays right here in Iowa. This is the trickle-up economy from people, families, and communities up. So the reason I'm running for president is to let us know that we're in the midst of this automation wave, and we need to wake America up to the fact that this is happening and that we need solutions that actually rise to the scale of the transformation. You campaigned heavily on this idea of the freedom dividend, and, and some other candidates have talked about a universal basic income for all <coughs> Americans. It's basically the same thing, correct? Yes. And so tell us why you think that idea would work um, in terms of, it, especially um, financially. Uh, how do you pay for that? Is the economy really going to grow enough to, to help you pay for that? Well, again, if you imagine in Iowa where everyone's getting $1,000 a month, the money is just going to circulate through your economy over and over again. It's going to go to Main Street businesses that are then going to spend it directly on workers uh, and uh, goods and services here. So the money doesn't disappear. Uh, the money actually in our hands is going to be much more uh, productive. And one of the comparisons I make is that if I were to somehow give Jeff Bezos $1,000 a month, it would have zero effect on the economy. <laughs> like, like you wouldn't even notice be changing one digit in one of his accounts. Like it'd be a non-event. But if you put $1,000 a month in the hands of the average Iowan, right now 78% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. Almost half can't afford an unexpected $400 bill. And as you all know, I'm doing this for a family in Iowa right now, uh, Kyle Christensen, and he's at home caring for his ailing mother. He's getting by on uh, contract work and so the thousand dollars a month ends up just getting the boot off of their throats a bit uh, lets them breathe a little bit lets him uh, actually start to think more about how he can better provide for his mother instead of just scrambling every month so the, the money doesn't disappear it grows our uh, consumer economy directly it would save us tens of billions of dollars on things like incarceration homelessness services uh, emergency room health care. Uh, this is very politician-y, but I was in New Hampshire and a corrections officer said to me, we should pay people to stay out of jail because it's so expensive when they're in jail. Uh, and so you think about uh, how this money would be spent. It's investing in us in a way that would actually save us money in the long run. Okay. 
you still have to have a certain amount of money to run the federal government, however, and you know what we saw with the Trump tax cuts is they said that we were going to be putting that money into the economy and it would pay for itself, uh, but that has not happened, um, possibly because a lot of the money went to the shareholders top income earner and top income earner. That's right. This is the reverse of that. So one of the biggest lies in American life right now is that we don't have the money. We clearly have the money. I mean, our economy is up to over twenty trillion dollars up $5 trillion in the last 12 years. And if you look at the irresponsibility of the Trump tax cuts that you cite, the Republicans were like, where are we going to get the money? Where are we going to get the money? Then when it was time to pull the lever on a $1.5 trillion tax cut, the vast majority of which went to shareholders uh, and the wealthy, then there was money. Uh, the same thing when Wall Street needed a bailout in the financial crisis. We printed $4 trillion for Wall Street. Do you remember anyone looking around saying, where are we going to get the money? Do you remember voting for that? No one here in Iowa voted for that because none of us voted for it. But when, the, the, when push came to shove, there was the $4 trillion for the banks. So we have the money. The Trump tax cut was the reverse of what we should be doing. It, that, that was the moral equivalent of what I was just describing, like you shove some money to Jeff Bezos and it does nothing. <laughs> About 6% of the $1.5 trillion tax cut went to workers. I mean, it was the least effective, least efficient thing you could have done. You know what would be incredibly efficient is putting money directly into our hands and we have the resources to do it. Are you going to means test this or are you going to give Jeff Bezos his thousand bucks? Uh, he'll, he'll get his thousand bucks too, uh, just to remind him he is an American. Uh, and the, the means testing actually causes more problems than it solves. This is based on the experience that they've had in Alaska over the last 40 years. In Alaska, everyone gets between one and two thousand dollars a year from the petroleum dividend. No questions asked. It's wildly popular, has created thousands of jobs, has improved income inequality and children's health in a deeply conservative state. And the richest Alaskan gets it, the poorest Alaskan gets it. There's no stigma attached to it. There's no monitoring. There's no one checking to see, oh, did you make the same amount you did this year as you did last year? All of that disappears. Uh, and so it would not be means tested. It would be a universal right of citizenship. The other big uh, criticism against universal basic income plans is that uh, people think it will erode the dignity and value of work, that um, if suddenly you're getting $1,000 a month uh, paycheck without having to lift a finger, that people just won't feel like they need to work. Um, what's your response to that, especially in a you know, state like Iowa where um, employers are crying out for enough workers? There, there are two things I'd say. The first is to just look at my own family. My wife is at home with our two boys right now, one of whom is autistic. What does her uh, work figure in right now with the economy? Um, what does the market value her work at? Both of those figures are zero, and we know that's the opposite of the truth. We know that the work she's doing is among the most challenging and vital work in our society. So putting this money into our hands actually expands what we think of as work. It includes people like Kyle, who's at home with his ailing mother, and every caregiver and parent, and someone who's making their family and community stronger. Uh, the, the second thing is that, you know what's really destroying the dignity of work is people feeling like they have to do jobs that are somewhat exploitative just in order to survive, and then us selling ourselves that, oh, that's actually super dignified. <laughs> it's actually not dignified for someone to feel like they have to do anything under the sun just in order to uh, make ends meet. And we know here in Iowa and around the country, it's harder and harder for people to make ends meet on one job because the, the, corporate, uh, the corporate incentives are to try and minimize the amount of uh, compensation that each worker will get just down to that smidgen where it's like just enough so that you'll survive but no more. Uh, and so that to me is the undignified reality that we're right now somehow tolerating. You also use the phrase human-centered capitalism. Explain what that means and uh, you use an example on your website of the opposite of human-centered capitalism which I think a lot of people have experienced in which you buy a ticket on an airline and then they don't feel like they have to put you on the flight because somebody else came up and paid more for the ticket at the last minute. So how, how, how do you actually stop that kind of practice? Um, and it, you know, go ahead. Well, no, in that particular case, uh, what I've suggested is a rule that says that they cannot remove you from a flight that you paid for 
unless you choose to, and all they can do is just offer more and more money until someone says yes, and if no, and if no one says yes, then they're out of luck. Isn't that what they do now, though? No, no. I mean, in some cases, they just actually uh, make that determination on behalf of the customer. And if you prevent them from doing that, doesn't that make everybody's ticket cost more? Not really. <laughs> that, that, that's, that's not really, because the, 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 uh, the incremental profit that they're eking out by mistreating this very small number of uh, passengers is not meaningful in terms of the average ticket buyer's um, experience or price. But the, the bigger picture, though, is that we have this system that is geared around GDP and stock market prices and valuation. You know what else are record highs right now? Stress levels, financial insecurity, depression, drug overdoses, suicides. It's gotten so bad that our life expectancy as a country has declined for the last three years because suicides and drug overdoses have overtaken vehicle deaths as causes of death for the first time in our history. It is not normal for life expectancy to decline in a developed country for one year, let alone three. The last time America's life expectancy declined for three years in a row was 100 years ago during the Spanish flu of 1918. You have to go that far back to find another period of declining life expectancy. So you have to look up and say, are we measuring the right things if we're all celebrating record high GDP while our life expectancy is declining? And the clear answer is no. The clear answer is that we're measuring the wrong things. And even the inventor of GDP said, this is a terrible measurement of national well-being and we should never use it as that. <laughs> you know, and that was 100 years ago. And so now we're following GDP off a cliff. One example I use is that self-driving trucks will be tremendous for GDP. They will be terrible for the 3.5 million Americans who drive a truck for a living and the 7 million Americans who work at places like Iowa 80 and the truck stops, motels, diners, and retail establishments that rely upon the truckers getting out and having a meal. But GDP will ignore all of those social costs. GDP will just look up and say, hey, we're saving $168 billion a year on truck driving costs, because that's what the figure is. And think about what that number means. That means that if you're a, a competent investor, you can justify spending billions of dollars hiring the best engineers in the country to try and solve that problem. What is the financial incentive around improving the lives of the 3.5 million truck drivers? Virtually non-existent. And that's one reason why dozens of truck drivers protested just a couple months ago, because their driving time was being digitally monitored and they hate it. You know what they're gonna hate even more? When they see that robot truck on the highway that never stops. Right now, they need to stop after 14 hours to go to sleep. I mean, that's, that, that's the way their trucks are timing them. But imagine being someone who took out tens of thousands of dollars in personal loans to be your own boss and have your truck and then competing against a robot truck. That's the reality that they're going to be facing very soon, and they know it. So this is what happens if you obey GDP and capital efficiency to their logical extremes. Our only way out is to use our own well-being as the actual measurements for the economy. So instead of saying GDP good and human well-being incidental, you actually say human well-being is the barometer of the economy. That's our health and life expectancy, our mental health and freedom from substance abuse, uh, how our kids are doing, childhood success rates, how clean our air and water are. You, we actually have numbers for these things and we could say this is the new parameter of economic progress. And if we do not make that kind of move, then we're going to be stuck chasing the wrong measurements as our lives deteriorate and we wonder why, because we're being sold a bill of goods. They just turn on the TV news and it's like record high GDP, you should be happy about it. And then you look around and, and wonder why your neighborhood's going to, um, uh, to the wrong direction. Even if you measure economic success in a different way, these companies are still going to be measuring their success by the bottom line. I mean, how do you tell them that uh, they can't bring in robot truck drivers? Uh, they're making a business decision. How can the government tell them that they can't do that? Well, so that, that is the direction that we, uh, in some ways, are heading right now, is you're going to see this massive lobbying effort in various professions to say, you can't automate my job. One major lobby that's very powerful, the medical lobby. The doctors will say, got to be a human doctor. I don't care what this, the data says that an AI doctor can diagnose this tumor more efficiently than the human radiologist. Still going to need a human radiologist. Medical lobby, very, very powerful. You know who has virtually no lobby? 
the retail employees. That's why 30% of stores and malls are going to close and no one's going to care, even though being a retail worker is still the most common job in this country. Average retail worker is a 39-year-old woman making between $9 and $10 an hour, but no one cares about her. And she does, has no voice in terms of stopping automation. And so truck driving is going to be an interesting case because only 13% of truckers are unionized. It is not a, as powerful a lobby as you'd imagine. You know, 87% of truckers are small business owners in their own business. So even if you were to want to craft some large-scale negotiation, it's unclear who you would negotiate with. Like, who negotiates on behalf of these 87% of 3.5 million truck drivers? So what you're going to see is you're going to see a knee-jerk reaction saying, well, we just have to stop the automation. Uh, and then the big questions that we have to ask are, are we going to do things much less efficiently to preserve large numbers of jobs for social order. Now, what I'm recommending is that we take the gains from automation, spread them to people as quickly and broadly as possible, and then have real intelligent plans in place. So on the trucking front, I'm proposing a czar that says, look, if we're gonna save $168 billion a year on automating away truck driving, maybe you take 25% of that, which is $40 billion a year, and you build a transition plan and runway for some of these truckers so that they're not going home to nothing. And they have this freedom dividend in place so that it's not an existential threat, like there's a large scale social adjustment that needs to be made. But one of the things that's driving me, as you'll see in my book, I studied what happened to the four million manufacturing workers who lost their jobs here in Iowa and around the country. According to economic theory, which I studied, those workers would get retrained, reskilled, uh, find new, higher productivity jobs, um, move for new jobs, and all would be well. That is not what happened, and we all know that here around this table, because you saw what happened to the communities here in Iowa. About half of those workers left the workforce and never worked again. And of that group, about half filed for disability. And then you saw surges in drug overdoses and suicides in those communities. None of this is in, a, in my economics tech, textbook. None of it said, if you get rid of this many jobs, people go home, drink a lot, uh, start to kill themselves, vote for Donald Trump. Like that, that was not in the textbook. But that is what happened in real life. And so if you were to want to project what's going to happen to the truck drivers, it's going to be very similar to that, but turned up to the nth degree. Because truckers are, uh, uh, if anything, an even more dramatic population uh, of workers in terms of their next best economic alternative. Most of them have high school educations. They make about $46,000 a year. Tens of thousands of them are ex-military. If you say that, hey, your steady middle class job is about to disappear, many of them do not have excellent uh, economic alternatives. And so the flashpoint here will be something on a scale that uh, we, have, we haven't seen in decades. Another one of your proposals, which is really intriguing, um, is to use what you've called a legion of builders and destroyers to oversee infrastructure decisions. That sounds like a really cool video game. First of all, congratulations on the name. Um, how would that Thank work in real life? So one of the problems we have in America is that we're not very good at building or rebuilding things anymore. Uh, and you can see it in reaction to natural disasters. You can see it with the rebuilding of Puerto Rico or not rebuilding in many cases that the federal government doesn't have a great way of actually uh, rebuilding infrastructure in an area. What the federal government now does is it cuts a check to private contractors in an area who then end up uh, siphoning some of that money off and then the efficiency is not what it could or should be. Now at the same time, if you look at our government, we're spending 750 billion plus on uh, military industrial complex, armed forces, uh, bases everywhere. And we have this ongoing need in infrastructure. So what I'm proposing is that we build a domestic infrastructure force that's standing. That's, you could think of it as a new uh, civil armed services uh, that then is able to tear down derelict buildings in Midwestern cities that don't have the budgetary resources to do so. Uh, I'm heading to Detroit, as you all know, next week. I've spent a lot of the last seven years in Detroit. There are 30,000 or so derelict buildings in Detroit. And no one has the money to tear them down. Not even Dan Gilbert. You know, everyone's looking around saying, okay, it's gonna cost four or five billion dollars to try and correctly deal with these derelict buildings, but no one has four or five billion dollars lying around in Michigan. Same thing's true in 
Indiana, Ohio, or around the country. And so this is another problem that there's no market incentive for. Uh, and so to me, it would make perfect sense for the federal government to have a standing force that would say, if you request that we come in and start properly demolishing buildings and clearing them out, then we can do that. Uh, or if there's a natural disaster here in Iowa with a flood uh, or in another part of the, the country, that we actually have a standing domestic force that can respond to them in a way that's uh, effective and geared toward the needs of this time. A couple questions on that. Is, is this like the super fund that was going in and you know, giving states money to clean up you know, polluted areas? And secondarily, you mentioned floods and other disasters. Isn't that what the National Guard does? They come in and help states or they're state-based and they, so how does that work? So the, the idea behind this infrastructure force, right now uh, the government cuts checks and this would actually be uh, engineers, equipment, uh, people, uh, know-how, where they'd go in and be able to help on, on that level. It is similar to what the National Guard is doing now or the National Guard. National Guard though often is more in like an order keeping and uh, aid distribution uh, capacity and the goal is that there's a force that actually is geared towards uh, building, rebuilding, and modernizing infrastructure. And how many people would you think that force would take? Oh, uh, well, the, the great thing is you could employ uh, hundreds of thousands of people um, if it were done at scale. And so the federal government would pay their salaries? Yeah, it would. It would employ as needed? Yes, it would be similar to, so the, the proposal I have is that we divert uh, 10 to 20 percent of the current budget that we're using on uh, the military towards an ongoing infrastructure force. So at that scale, you'd be looking at uh, at least tens of thousands of. Could you combine that with a national service requirement? You could. You could. And one of the things, I've run a national service organization, and I love the idea of national service. I'm so for gap years. I think they're so good for uh, maturation. I'm also for an American exchange program where we send high school seniors to another part of the country to spend a month living and working so that they get a sense. And then they'd also have friends in other parts of the country and then if you tried to generalize about people in you know, Chicago or Arkansas, you'd be like, I actually know someone <laughs> who's from there. I'm Facebook friends with them, they're fine. Um, the, one of the challenges around trying to create a National Service Corps is that the administration and cost associated with that tends to be quite high. Um, if you look at our existing organizations. And so that's one reason why uh, having an existing core that you could actually channel people to would be extraordinarily helpful. Uh, would you be putting private contractors in out of work um, by sh taking all this government? Um, well, right, the government do the work? right now, nobody's tearing down the buildings in Detroit. So it's not like, <laughs> not like they're private jobs that, uh, I mean, there's so many needs around the country. We all know it. Uh, what, what did we get from our, uh, evaluation of our own infra infrastructure. It's something like a D, D plus. Uh, the, the estimated bill to rebuild our infrastructure to modern capacities is something like $4 trillion. So the, the, the needs are so massive that it's not like you'd be crowding out private industry because private industry would have plenty of work to do. But I think private, private contractors would be happy to tear down uh, buildings if somebody provided the money to do it, right? I mean, it, it, it's not just you're saying the federal government is going to actually do the work as opposed to paying somebody locally to do it, right? I mean, is that... Well, if you look at a situation like Puerto Rico, uh, you know, there, aren't, there weren't private contractors all over Puerto Rico that could actually like, manage a rebuild. There, there are certain but things people, where... People move to Puerto Rico. I mean, I, I know contractors who have been living in Puerto Rico for a long time, you know, just working on rebuild. Yeah, and you know, I'm sure even if you had a very competent infrastructure force, there would always be a need for private contractors uh, supplementing and supplying and everything. I mean, you know, it's like it, these operations tend to be very, very uh, complex. I mean, it is very much analogous to what's going on. And you could have a separate conversation about the privatization of our military, but uh, like the same thing happens in a military theater where you have armed forces and then you often have private contractors supplementing them in various ways. You've suggested we can address climate change in an innovative way through geoengineering, um, things like physically blocking the sunlight. Explain to us what that means, and can we really rely on technology that does not exist yet? 
um, to get us through this climate crisis? So first I would say we categorically cannot rely upon technology to somehow bail us out of this climate crisis. Uh, climate change is an existential threat to our way of life. The four last years have been the four warmest years in recorded history. Uh, you don't need to be a scientist to put two and two together and say that this threat is unfortunately accelerating and getting worse. And so this is a situation where we have to do everything under the sun. Uh, and so that includes the things that are long overdue, like rejoining the Paris Accords, uh, implementing a carbon fee and dividend, investing in an infrastructure that's much more uh, modern and sustainable. Uh, but we also have to acknowledge the fact that the horse has left the barn. In all likelihood, the climate will continue to warm. We're seeing the effects right now here in Iowa and around the country. And so we have to start trying to mitigate the worst effects directly. So geoengineering is a big fancy sounding word, but one of the primary methods that people recommend is just planting lots of trees. That's geoengineering. Like planting a lot, lot of trees would be very, very helpful in terms of soaking up some of the carbon in the atmosphere. Uh, right, right now there are various scientists and engineers who are looking at various geoengineering techniques, uh, but there's not meaningful resources behind it. There's not any even convening. Um, they're doing this work in isolation. And one of the things I'd suggest is that this is going to come to a head in the next couple of decades internationally. Like we're not obviously not the only country in the world that's going to be impacted by climate change. And so some of the other major powers, in my opinion, will start uh, experimenting with geoengineering in the coming years. And so we need to lead on this. We need to convene uh, experts internationally. So it's not that 15 years from now we're looking at some other country doing something that obviously is going to affect all of us. Now, you've been an advocate for Medicare for all, correct? Yes. Um, Vice President Biden said this week that it would end me Medicare as we know it, and that it's just not realistic. How do you respond to that? Well, uh, I think that it is realistic. Uh, I, I think that if you look at our system right now, we're in the worst of all worlds, where we're spending twice as much on our health care as other countries to worse results. Uh, and so, when you dig into why that is, it's because our incentive system is not what it should be. Uh, it's one of the reasons why our costs are so much higher. Now we have a system built around generating revenue and not improving health. And if you talk to medical healthcare providers, uh, there's often a, a relationship between what they're doing uh, and either not getting sued or making more money where if you suddenly remove the financial incentives, the amounts of procedures go down, <laughs> like, that, like a lot of the activity goes down. And so uh, Medicare uh, right now is wildly popular. And Medicare, even now, we have not gone far enough in terms of trying to negotiate prices. Uh, the drug lobby has been very powerful in saying, hey, even Medicare can't try and negotiate prices on behalf of the American people. Uh, and so it's both expanding what Medicare provides and also uh, trying to improve its ability to negotiate for lower rates and higher access. And clearly, the more people you're negotiating on behalf of, the more clout you have. Uh, but right now, our system is, is a stealth anchor on the economy. And what do I mean by that? Uh, well, you all work at this company. I've run a company, and it makes it harder to hire people it makes it harder to treat people well and give them proper benefits. Like your incentives just to treat everyone like a contractor because then you don't have to deal with their healthcare coverage. It makes it harder for people to switch jobs. It results in something called job lock where everyone just stays in their job because they need their healthcare. Uh, I, I tell a story about when I told my wife I was gonna run for president, her first question to me was, what are we gonna do about our healthcare? <laughs> so so the, the, this is something that is actually a massive weight on our economic dynamism and growth because it's keeping everyone stuck in place. And we don't talk about that enough. How many more entrepreneurs would there be if you actually had health care that they didn't have to worry about on that level? So we need to start thinking in those terms about how we can actually generate dynamism and growth in our economy and not just look at this as uh, a cost center because it's much more than that. You mentioned the medical lobby pushing back against automation, um, but in places here like in here, here in Iowa, we just don't have enough workforce. We're not putting people out of jobs if we, if we choose automation. Um, is, the, 
Is that something that the federal government should be encouraging? The federal government should be encouraging automated automation in healthcare, especially in places like Iowa where we don't have enough medical staff and workforce. I'm very passionate about this. You talk about the medical lobby. You have to look around and ask, why the heck do we have a doctor shortage here in this country? Everyone knows we have a massive doctor shortage and primary care, care physician shortage. And the people that bear the brunt of that are people in rural areas who look up and say, you know, I have to drive like 60, 70 miles to be able to, to see a specialist or a doctor. There are a couple of big reasons. You have a medical lobby that's been artificially containing, uh, constraining the supply of doctors for decades. Like you looked up and said, we need more doctors. And the medical lobby is like, eh, 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 we're going to just keep it just <laughs> as it is. And then the next question you ask is, uh, okay, say, okay, we don't have enough doctors. Then how about you let some non-doctors do some things? And again, the medical lobby is like, no, 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 got to be a doctor. Uh, and so that's why we're in this bind where the incentives, unfortunately, for the medical lobby are to constrain supply, so you have to go through this incredibly expensive training process. And the training process, you know what that means? That means that no one wants to be a primary care physician because you load them up with $200,000 in med school debt and say, guess what? If you specialize, you get paid more. Then what do people do? Be like, well, I guess I don't want to be a family doctor because that means I'm going to make less and I owe $200,000. So how about I just tack on another couple of years and then I can become like a, a radiologist or an oncologist or something that's going to be more lucrative and I'll see if you were paid. So you have. Furthermore, you can't go work for the VA either because you don't get paid. Yeah. So you have these two constraints on supply, or three really. One, you have the constraint on doctors. Two, you have the constraint on non doctors actually being able to treat people and see patients. Three, the training process means you have a massive shortage of primary care doctors because you're incentivizing all these doctors to go into specialties and go to urban areas that can pay them more. Now, uh, so you have to attack all three of these things. Uh, you have to increase the supply. You have to try to decrease the cost of training that falls on the individual. And then you have to loosen up regulation and say, look, if you're in a rural area and there are no MDs around or the MD to population ratio is below a certain level, guess what? Nurse practitioners should be able to, <laughs> to, to do like 85% of what the doctor is doing, especially if they can be supplemented <laughs> by technology and AI. Or you have telemedicine. I, I was just meeting with a friend who's now licensed in all 50 states and you can have telemedicine that pipes in. So what would be reasonable for many rural communities is you empower nurse practitioners or primary care providers that aren't MDs in that community, and then if they need to refer to a doctor, then they beam the doctor in, and then you, you get that done. Uh, and that's something that would be much more achievable if the medical lobby wasn't uh, trying to keep it from happening. Isn't that a state-by-state state question on who you license and what you allow them to do? I mean, it, the federal government obviously is involved in, in the healthcare industry and, and medical regulations, but you know, some states could decide that indeed nurse practitioners should have X power in order to get a license and some could not. Yeah, but uh, one of the reasons why this is such a disaster for patients and consumers is because the medical lobby has intentionally pushed a state-by-state -state system, which makes it so if I'm an MD, I get licensed uh, here in Iowa, then I'm not supposed to see anyone like in Minnesota and whatnot. And so that's another way they artificially constrain supply that if you can lower the, and if you actually look at the substantive differences between being licensed in different states, like this, it's like we, we know that if someone's a doctor and they pass the licensing test in one state, like they, they have 95% plus of, the, of what they need to be licensed in the neighboring state. It's just they've set up another process and another expense and another time consuming set of hoops to jump through to try and keep you from being able to practice across the border really just to protect the doctors in each area. So you would take licensing power away from states and give it to the federal government so you could enact the system? I would encourage multi-state licensing uh, based upon the substance of the tests. And so if there was a state that had a genuine substantive difference saying they really do need to know this thing, but in many of these cases these distinctions are uh, um, somewhat uh, marginal or artificial. I want to make sure we have, get through a couple of issues that I know people want to hear from you about, and one of them is immigration. Um, the, the question came up at the debate um, uh, from one of your colleagues, uh, Secretary Castro, that we should just decriminalize crossing the border. Um, you know, you might make it a civil offense, um, but you're not making it people a criminal if they cross the border to seek asylum. Do you agree with that? 
When I dug into his proposal, uh, what I found compelling was the execution or implementation of it. Uh, because I'm an execution guy, like I'm an operator, and just trying to find the facts on the ground. And so right now the criminalization of crossing the border ends up just gumming up the criminal courts all around those regions. And so those courts then actually have uh, an inability to, to actually deal with what you'd think would be their core, uh, their core mission, which is addressing criminal proceedings where they are. But they can't do that effectively because they have this flood of border crossers. And so if, if that's the reality of what we're facing, then it does not make sense to treat it as a criminal uh, uh, offense um, if it's going to flood our criminal courts in these areas, we should treat it as a different type of offense and then build up the proper infrastructure to be able to treat it in a way that would not cause problems in other parts of the legal system. And uh, the broader question about immigration, um, you know, what is the, um, the right way to handle not only legal immigration, but to deal with those who are currently outside the system? So. It's a massive issue. Right now we have over 11 million undocumented immigrants in the United States. And to me, there are three approaches you can take. Uh, approach number one is you can pretend to deport them. And when I say pretend is that it makes absolutely no sense practically to suggest deporting 11 million people. It would collapse regional economies. It, it would separate families. The whole thing is a non-starter. Is that what the Trump administration is doing now? I believe so. They're pretending that deportation's an actual solution on scale when it clearly is not. Uh, number two is you can do nothing, which is our, our other major approach. <laughs> and, and then you end up with massive problems uh, at every step because uh, you don't know who anyone is and they do commit crimes. It's a massive problem. They show up in emergency rooms uh, and institutions in various ways that end up incurring costs, get into car accidents, like all of the above. I mean, they're, they're, these are the things that just happen when you have 11 million people um, in your country that you don't know who they are. So the third path, which is the path we should pursue, and the path that actually Republicans were on board with um, a number of years ago is to try and create a multi-year path to citizenship that would give them the ability to integrate into society over an extended period of time if they didn't commit crimes and uh, paid taxes and were willing to abide by various um, requirements. One thing on a personal level, my father immigrated to this country. I'm the son of immigrants. My mom, too. They met as graduate students at, at Berkeley. My father generated 69 U.S. patents for GE and IBM. Uh, and so I think that's a good deal for the U.S. <laughs> that, um, because I remember asking him as a kid, it's like, hey, Dad, how much do you get paid when you generate a patent? He's like, oh, you know, $200. And I was like, that doesn't sound like a lot. And I was like, oh, but they pay my salary so I can put a roof over your head and the rest of it. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I get the deal. So uh, immigrants make our country stronger, more dynamic, uh, more innovative, and we need to bear that in mind and also stop scapegoating immigrants for economic dislocations that immigrants have very little to do with. Uh, right now, if you go to a factory here in Iowa, it's much more likely to be wall-to-wall -wall robots and machines. And this is true uh, on the farms, too, increasingly. Um, and so that's going to be the trend. And so trying to scapegoat immigrants for economic problems is missing the core set of issues. When I looked into the impact on manufacturing work, as an example. Studies show that it was 80% because of automation, robots, and technology, to give you a sense of the, the numbers. So, some people argue that people like the folks who uh, you know, took the time and did the work to come here the right way um, should be opposed to people who uh, came here illegally and then somehow are going to get a path to citizenship. What do you say to that? Well, I think that the uh, reason why the reason why people come to this country are very clear. The same reason my family came here is trying to create a better life for uh, their kids, and you know it worked for me and my brother. And so these incentives have been in place for for years and and uh, are very universal, shall we say. So if you have a process in place and people are pursuing it through our current immigration system, that's tremendous. Uh, and if we have this pathway to citizenship, it will be longer, more time consuming, more arduous uh, than our existing system in most every case. Um, but we can't let the fact that uh, certain people might have certain feelings obscure the fact that, look, we have over 11 million people in this country that we have to figure out uh, a path for. And uh, you know, that's just the 
uh, practical reality of where we are. I would love to hear um, how you're going to hack the government um, and the, the government dysfunction, um, because a lot of these ideas um, sound really good, um, but we don't have a Congress right now that um, is capable of coming together and doing passing a budget. Well, it's one reason why people are so excited about my campaign is they sense that I'm very non-ideological. Uh, I just want to solve the problems on the ground. And my flagship proposal of this freedom dividend of $1,000 a month crosses party lines uh, in a way that, that gets people excited on both sides of the aisle. Again, the state that's had a dividend in place for almost 40 years is Alaska, which is a deep red conservative state. Libertarians like the dividend, conservatives like the dividend, and progressives like the dividend because it's going to put more money into the hands of families, it's going to make a, a, our communities stronger. And so my campaign is based on the idea that Americans just want to have solutions to solve the problems and that cash in our hands would be one of the most effective, if not the most effective solution. So if you imagine a world where I become President of the United States, thank you Iowa, you made it happen. <laughs> I become President of the United States in 2021, Democrats and progressives will be so excited to have beaten Donald Trump, they'll be like, yes. And we'll all know it's in large part because I've championed this dividend. And then Republicans and conservatives will look up and say, wait a minute, this is a massive win for rural areas, for red states on the interior, for places that have been blasted by uh, automation and, and uh, getting rid of many of the jobs. Am I really going to stand in the way of my constituents uh, and this dividend? And we don't need 80% of Congress to pass this. We need 51%. You get this across the finish line in Congress, start getting more money into people's hands. This would become the favorite thing that our government's ever done in people's lifetimes. Uh, in essence, they'll be like, I can't believe the government did something I really love. And then they'd look up and say, wow, maybe we can actually do some stuff together. Maybe part of this too is that one of the reasons why we're so polarized and not able to get anything done is that 78% of our fellow Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. Uh, you know, if you can't pay your bills, you have what's called a mindset of scarcity. And a mindset of scarcity has been shown to decrease your functional IQ by 13 points or one standard deviation. So if you get a sense that our fellow Americans are getting less reasonable or optimistic, uh, we are. Because if you can't pay your bills, that's just what happens to you. And so this would reverse that. Like the polarization is in part because people have this sense that if you get something, I'm getting shafted. <laughs> you know, it's like that is not enough, and if you're getting it, then I'm mad. Uh, that's the reverse of where we should be, which is the mindset of abundance, which is like, you get it, that's not bad on me. Maybe that's good for me. And it's like, you know, it's like we're members of the same team. Uh, and so the, the big move we have to make is get the economic boot off of people's throats, reduce the pol polar, I was going to say polarity, but you could say polarization, uh, and then get people to think about how we can solve other problems. So first big move, the dividend, but then the next big move might be something like infrastructure that most Americans agree on, it's been historically bipartisan, uh, would end up generating activity in people's uh, communities. And so you make big moves. Another thing that most people agree on is redefining our economic measurements to actually work for us. Uh, it's not like conservatives are zealots where they look up and say, in, you know, like stock market, like a lot, they have families. Like you look up and say, hey, uh, we need to actually start measuring things that matter to us. So you can do things that are bipartisan, that are transformative, but it's going to take someone like me to do it, frankly. Like it's not going to be someone who is very distinctly of a particular political orientation and then maybe ekes out an election by like 1% and then you wind up with a very similar dynamic to what you have right now. The dynamic, go ahead. On, on the UBI that I've been thinking about as you've been talking about it today, but even in the past, one is it would be a flat, flat rate across the country. Mm -hmm. I was born and raised in New York City. $1,000 is a lot different there than, here. than it is in rural Iowa. And so how would you adjust for that if you want to basically help everyone equally? And then the other thing is you often mention Alaska. Alaska actually has a higher rate of poverty than in Iowa, which doesn't have any basic income. So how does that prove its success? I'll do the second one first. Um, so you have to look at what Alaska would look like without the dividend. <laughs> you, know, it's like, you know, I mean, it's not like the, the dividend in Alaska has been a cure-all for all of the, the, the problems there. But if you look at it without the dividend, it's clear that child poverty would be higher, uh, uh, mal malnutrition would be higher, there would be fewer jobs. 
and it's one reason why the dividend is so effective there is that they're coming off of frankly a low base. Uh, to your question about geographic uh, calibration, the great thing about the thousand dollars a month is that it's portable. It goes with you wherever you, you go. So I live in New York now. Uh, where where were you in New York City? I was born and raised in Greenwich Village. Oh, yeah, so Greenwich Village very expensive now, <laughs> as, you, as you know. It's a very very cool neighborhood. So there are people that are in New York City right now that uh, are constantly grinding uh, against this set of costs. They're like, oh gosh, everything's so expensive. If they had a thousand bucks a month that was portable, some of them might actually go to Vermont or New England or someplace and set up shop, um, and then work on their screenplay or work on the thing that they thought they were working on when they weren't, <laughs> you know, like having to. Um, and then the reverse is true too, where someone from uh, New England might say, hey, I, I've always wanted to give Boston a shot, but like I've never had the money and like I've lived at home and I don't really had, I didn't have a uh, hot lead on a job. But with this thousand bucks a month, I can go and at least, you know, scrape by and then look for a job there. So it increased dynamism in both directions. But it's also true that you could not set up a system where you had it scaled based upon your cost of living because you'd end up with this crazy incentive system for everyone to say, I live someplace expensive so I can get more money. And then they'd like sneak off someplace cheap. And then you'd have this, uh, this uh, incredible monitoring problem where people would constantly be trying to claim residency in particular high cost areas and then uh, just driving someplace else. I want to uh, ask you quickly about trade. Um, big, very important to Iowa, we're having uh, farmers still struggling um, while President Trump pursues his trade war with China. Um, how, how do you strike a balance between uh, the idea that perhaps some of these trade deals aren't that great uh, for the United States, especially for manufacturing jobs, et cetera, um, but you have uh, farmers who really depend on, on free trade? I am generally pro-trade. Trade is generally a win for our country. And I've talked to farmers and producers here in Iowa who are very, very angry about the tariffs. Uh, many of them voted for Donald Trump and then they feel like the tariffs have done them wrong. Um, it is also the case though that some of the trade deals have been bad for certain parts of the American workforce and certain, uh, certain groups of Americans. And so one of the big themes of my campaign is to try and spread the benefits more broadly and quickly. So if you have a particular trade deal where you can identify some people are going to do great from this, some people are not going to do, do great, you have to try and take the benefits and transfer them to the people that are being left out in the cold as much as possible. Right now we don't have enough of that going on. And when we do do that, unfortunately, it's in the form of somewhat paternalistic programs. And what I mean by this is that some of the accompanying uh, conditions on the trade deals in the past were, hey, we're going to put all this money into retraining manufacturing workers. We get we're going to get rid of a lot of manufacturing workers, but it's going to be okay because we're going to retrain them. And what that did not take into account was that the success rates of those retraining programs turned out to be very low, 0 to 15 percent. Uh, and so the government was like, well, we got the money to retrain them, but then 85 percent of them didn't get retrained. And, and so that happens months, years after the fact. So what you have to do is you have to try and transfer the gains directly in a way that's usable for uh, the workers and individuals and families. And the best way to do that is straight cash. Uh, you know, this is a really off the wall question, but um, I would expect a guy like you to be wearing an Apple Watch or something like that. Oh gosh, no! This is a Shinola it, watch. <laughs> I, it, I need to. But it stopped uh, and at it's, ten and after twelve. <laughs> It, so it's a Shinola watch that was made in Detroit. I'm friendly with the Shinola um, guys and gals. Uh, one of the Venture of America fellows actually worked at Shinola uh, in Detroit. It did stop. I have not had a chance to go replace the battery because I've been running for president, and so there's not a lot. So of uh, what day did it stop? When did um, time stop for you? Time stopped about a week ago, uh, and then I figure, ah, if I need the time, I, I can always uh, take out my phone. And yet you still wear the watch. And yeah, I still wear the watch. As a reminder, one, I need to get the battery swapped out. Um, but, but two, uh, you know, I just really like my Shinola watch. Actually, the, it looks like the CEO of Shinola might come to Detroit for the debate uh, as a guest. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I, at least I can do is advertise for a good so American it's company. Placement. It's product placement for my friends at Shinola. Yes, Shinola <laughs> watches, they're great, very handsome. This thing is only, you know, I mean, not only, they're not as expensive as some of the other luxury watches out there. <laughs> 
So uh, Iowa caucus um, voters uh, are putting electability at one of the, as one of their top priorities. Um, you're low in the polls. Uh, you have made the debates, uh, which is great for you. Um, but how do you get over that hump to make sure that more of them can recognize uh, who you are and um, what you're standing for? Well, thank you for asking. I, I do feel like the people of Iowa uh, are interested in me. I just need to share more about myself, uh, my values, my vision for the country. The thing I would say to the folks in Iowa is this. If you hit the fast forward button, let's say Iowa 10, 15, 20 years from now, what's it going to look like? Right now, you've lost 40,000 manufacturing jobs, 12,000 retail jobs you've lost as the stores start to close. Your young people feel like they have to often leave for other places to have the opportunities they need. It's a predominantly rural state, uh, and rural communities in particular are trying to find a path forward. I mean, this set of challenges that Iowa faces, this is the opportunity to try and create a different vision for the country that has an economy that works for us. It should not be the case that people feel like they have to leave their hometown in order to have a good life. And that is the subtext of a lot of American policy today. It's like, hey, you know, you don't have a, a path forward and, and then and like maybe there is something for you if you leave there and go to the city, essentially. Uh, and that, that is not how it has to be. Like we can make it so that the economy actually works for everyone here in Iowa and around the country, but it's gonna take big moves. You can't just nibble at the margins. You can't say, hey, if I get you high-speed internet access, everything's gonna be okay. Because the reality is if you have high-speed internet access in a rural area, it's not like a job like materialized as a result. It just means you can download videos faster. You know, I mean, I mean that's, that's the, the reality. It's not like, oh, now I've got my broadband, then I can just like, you know, start my million dollar internet company. I mean, that's just not, not the way it goes. Um, so the electability question, I'm already appealing to many people across the aisle. And many people in the subset of Americans that are politically disengaged. 25% of Americans, maybe not here in Iowa, because you all love your politics, but 25% of Americans are politically disengaged, they don't care. And we're getting a ton of them. If you go to uh, one of our events or rallies, you ask how many of you this is the first political event you ever went to, half the hands will go up. So we're activating a whole new group of people. We're getting people who voted for Donald Trump in every county, every region. We're getting libertarians who love this message of the freedom dividend. We're getting independents, and we're getting Democrats and progressives uh, over time. I can build a much broader coalition to beat Donald Trump in 2020 than any of the other candidates. And people are catching on to that. How do your ideas resonate out on the campaign trail? I mean, do audiences stand up and cheer when they hear your ideas? Or do they leave their sort of scratching their heads? So? If you want to see some theory. cheering reactions, if you go, just, we have all these rallies, and they'll actually cheer for things you would not imagine they'd cheer for Richard. They actually chant, for, chant the word PowerPoint. Uh, as I talk about how we're going to present the true facts of what's going on with American people's health and life expectancy every year, and I'm going to present at the State of the Union on a PowerPoint every year, and they go, PowerPoint, PowerPoint. There's a real appetite for actual solutions to the problems, and there's a real appetite for a different kind of conversation. Because unfortunately, our political conversations have degenerated into symbols and value statements, uh, you know, and, and tribalism. Uh, and so, what we need to do is we need to actually start looking at the problems on the ground. And people sense that that's what I'm all about. That I'm highly, uh, highly practical and numerate, and I don't care whose idea it was. If it's a good idea, let's let's run with it. There's a huge appetite for that. So there's more cheering and less head scratching than you'd think. Anything else? I want to give you. Uh, oh, you want to see a video of some PowerPoint chance? So you know. <laughs> okay. I want to give you a. We got, your, your clock has stopped, but ours is not. So I just <laughs> want to give you a minute to wrap up here. Well, again, just want to thank you all for this opportunity. I love being here in Iowa because you all have the future of the country in your hands, and you take the responsibility very seriously. I sometimes joke with people that if another state had the same power and responsibility, they would have no idea what to do with it <laughs> because you all have this built up set of heritage and institutions. And it's going to be up to you to bring in a, uh, an economy of the future uh, into existence. That if it doesn't take root here in Iowa, this vision, this vision can sweep the country in 2020 like that, with Iowa leading the way. We can build a trickle up economy from our people, our families, and communities up, but it has to happen here in Iowa. And if it doesn't happen here in Iowa, then we'll have another four years of the malls closing and the cars and trucks getting 
uh, closer to driving themselves and all these other changes. Like it or not, it's 2019, it's going to be 2020. Things that would strike people as science fiction are now fact. We all have supercomputers in our pockets. Donald Trump is our president. Uh, our communities are transforming before our eyes. We need to catch politics up to the true problems of this era. And it can only happen if the people in Iowa take the lead. Thank you very much, Andrew Yang.